Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel. And I'm Kate Humble and we're here in Pet's Corner with two undeniably adorable rabbits. I think this one looks a little bit like me. It does, you? with the fringe. <laughs> <laughs> but not all the animals here in Pet's Corner are quite so fluffy and sweet. Yes, and we have got a day, well, that I'm not particularly looking forward to ahead of us. We are going to have to get up close and personal with some of Pet's Corner's less appealing residents. And something tells me it's not going to be pleasant. No, so if you want to watch us, being absolutely terrified for the entire day, this is the programme for you. <laughs> also coming up... There's hell to pay when the vet needs blood samples from three of the lions. Cause for celebration in Pet's Corner. Mike and Michelle have had a baby. Oh, I don't even want to look. And all manner of creepy skin-crawling horrors when Kate and I face our phobias. She's got little sort of claws on the front. But first, we're going up to the giraffery, where a drama's unfolding. Seven weeks ago, Becky gave birth to a new calf, who's been named Evelyn. To start with, everything was going well. But now, mother and baby have had to be separated, because Becky was chewing at her daughter's ears. Keeper Ryan Hockley is keeping a close eye on Evelyn. Unfortunately, over the last few days, we've noticed that Becky's been um, paying a lot too much attention to her ears. Um, it's all part of the bonding process. You like to see the mother licking over the baby sort of quite regularly just to keep reinforcing the mother and, and baby bond. But she's just got too overzealous with it, really. And she's just started to crisp away Evelyn's ears a little bit. So for the time being, we've split them up and we're offering Evelyn a drink of milk ourselves, which she's taking fine, no problems there and uh, we're going to get the vet in. When Duncan Williams, the vet, came, he found that Evelyn's ears were in a far worse state than first thought. He's now come to check on her again. Because of all this damage that Becky's done by licking and biting, chewing the ears, the ear tips, um, the, the, the one on um, the left is really, really affected. This side here, you see the tip's gone necrotic and dead and I think the, the rest of the ears just filled up with blood, like it's a hematoma, that's what we call it. But this one here was just dripping pus yesterday. It was really, really badly infected, and we, uh, we caught her up, cleaned it out as belt, best we could, and uh, gave her a long-acting antibiotic injection, which I think is the reason why it's looking a lot, lot healthier and a lot, lot better today. But um, obviously that's pretty stressful to catch her, and we you know, took quite a long time to clean it up and stuff, so... It's not the sort of thing we want to do too often. Evelyn is facing a great deal of stress, not only from the treatment and being separated from her mother, but also having to feed from a bucket. She's a bit skinny. She's a bit small for a... Hello. Um, and, uh, unless she gets drinking plenty, I mean, I think, you know, she's going to be a sort of slow grower. It's quite a lot harder for an animal that's been suckling for two weeks to learn to drink out of a bucket. Totally different tongue mechanism. If they're used to suckling, this is going to be really sort of foreign to her. So I think that's why she's making such a mess, and I'm surprised she's doing as well as she is, really. Evelyn is so young, it would be a great comfort to her if only she could be reunited with her mother. But Becky would certainly make the baby's ears worse. The keeper in charge of the giraffes, Andy Hayton, was reluctant to separate them. It's a last resort. We didn't want to do it. You know, you don't want to go taking perfectly good bonded mums and babies away from each other. But unfortunately, Becky just kind of loves her a bit too much. It's just over a tenth mum thing, chewing her ears. She chewed Deanne's ears. So Deanne's only got half a set of ears. Once they get into this habit, they do it to all their babies. We've had this problem before, and you can't stop them. As soon as the ears are healed and there isn't actually an open wound, we'll try her back out. If Becky starts noshing her ears again, we'll, we'll bring her back in. But we're leaving her in with Jolly, which Jolly's overjoyed about because she doesn't have to go out in the park in the mud. So <laughs> Jolly can stay around the house and look after the baby. And the baby has sucked a couple of times off Jolly, so she's feeding off a giraffe. It's not ideal, but the, the, the baby's OK at the moment. Jolly has milk because she's got a calf of her own, who's five months old and almost weaned. Evelyn may be undernourished, but the biggest problem is her ears. 
This sort of infection could easily turn septic and lead to blood poisoning. It's called septicemia and it can be fatal. Now, everyone must wait and hope that the antibiotics take effect. We'll be back later to see what happens. As the name would suggest, Pet's Corner is filled with all sorts of friendly animals, although some of them are creatures that many people find rather creepy. But I'm not squeamish. In fact, I'm rather fond of snakes. And some of my best friends are rats. However, there is a monster here, which for me is the stuff of nightmares. And now the time has come to face my phobia. This is the feed room at Pets Corner, but it's also the place where some of the smaller animals get cleaned out. And I'm here with keeper Mike Holloman, who is going to make me do, I think, possibly <laughs> the nastiest thing I can imagine, Mike. Yes, possibly. Yes, reveal, okay. reveal what it is. Oh, I don't even want to look. This is a tarantula, isn't it? Yes, this is a curly-haired tarantula. And her name's Samantha. <laughs> And she's That's a, ludicrous. She's a darling. Yeah. Do you think she'll like me because I've got curly hair? I hope so. <laughs> so do I. I mean, they're not particularly messy, are they? Can't you just leave them? Uh, we she could says, do, hopefully. but uh, we've left her right. really until you came along. <laughs> oh, OK. Thanks, Mike. Uh, would you like to get her out? No, I you wouldn't. Sure? No, I really... Okay. I, I, well, actually, because I'm, I am really quite scared of her, um, I don't want to hurt her. I yeah. mean, they look quite tough, but are they? Uh, yeah, but they don't do very well if you drop them. It usually kills them. You hear really terrifying things about tarantulas, like they shoot spines out of the abdomen, out of the back. Come, sweetheart. How can you call her sweetheart? She's beautiful, look. I mean, she's an amazing-looking animal. Oh, Mike, she's I really beautiful. don't think I can hold her, though. You sure? Yeah. Why curly-haired? They don't look... Oh, she's quite active, too. Yes. Oh, no, Mike. Well, I'll tell you what, would you like to clean her out, then? OK, well, let's have a good look at her first. I, I, I'm going to admire her. I'm not sure I can quite hold her. Why is she called curly-haired? Because she doesn't look, look that curly. Look at the ones on the legs. It's sort of curly there. And this is a female. They're, they're a, a lot bigger than the males. Also, the male on the feeling legs on the front yeah. would have hooks, so when he mates with the female, he can cling on to her. And what do they eat? Do they eat people? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> only if their name's Kate Humble. <laughs> No, she'll, she'll eat um, grasshoppers and stuff like that in the wild, crickets. Right. And, uh, and how do they catch them? I mean, do they use any sort of poison? All tarantulas are slightly venomous. Right. Enough to sort of uh, quieten their prey down, sort of not actually stun them, but that sort of thing. And, and is it the hairs on the abdomen here that That's that what she'll it? flick. If she was frightened of you, she'd flick them at you. If you get them in the eyes, it can be quite bad, it can be dangerous. Right. She could bite you, but it's very rare. This is one of the quietest species of spider, actually. I, right. I do feel really wimpy, but... No, don't worry. Let me just see if I can put a leg on my... F oh, look at me, I'm shaking like a leaf. Come on. That's amazing. She's really light. I mean, she looks enormous, but yeah, she's it's a... quite sort of velvety feeling, isn't it? She's a lovely girl. Ooh. Right, yeah. OK. Um, let me do some cleaning and then I can okay. sort of forget about being uh, scared. What do right, I need to just, do? Just take the bits and pieces out and put on the towel. Are they important to uh, you? That bit of log is important because she can get, get in underneath and sort of hide. She could, um, you know, have a little nest under there if she wanted to. Because do they build webs like normal spiders? Yes, yeah, very silky. And the right. idea of that is so as the dirt doesn't fall in on the babies. Because she'll have about 500 babies when she's mated with the male. Ooh. Unfortunately for the male, I'm glad I'm not a male spider, he'll probably either she sometimes can eat them before they mate or just after or perhaps he'll die anyway within about two or three months. It's not very grateful, is no, it? No, but her ladyship here could live yeah. to about ten. This looks like gooey cotton wool, Mike. That's her drinker. What they do is they sit on there and they suck it out of the cotton wool. How so amazing. that's f full up with water. OK, that's everything. Right, just tip all the rubbish in the bucket. OK. So oh, just tip it into here. Yeah, tip it all out. They do seem a slightly mad pet to have. Do they make good pets? Uh, well, I wouldn't advise anybody having them, but having just said that, uh, they do, there's not much um, you have to do. You have to keep them warm. They need to be sort of about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And feeding twice a week, something like that, but they can go for quite some time without. And do you have to feed her live crickets and that kind of thing? I'm afraid so. She won't eat anything that's dead. Right. I mean, if she's about to um, shed her skin, yeah. uh, then they probably won't eat for a couple of months, maybe three months beforehand. 
I know, I thought it was only snakes that shed their skin. What do no, you mean? No, spiders, the whole lot comes off. In fact, it looks like a complete spider. OK, how's that looking? Oh, that's lovely. Is that all right? OK, Mike. Right, what you do, do you want to try and put her in? If we do it over the ball... OK, that's a good she idea. she drops. Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. Go on, put your hand in front. Go on, sweetie. And then you can put her in. Ooh, she's got little sort of claws on the front. Come on, girl. I've got my hands on too. That's it. Well done, Kate. <sighs> can someone make me a gin and tonic? <laughs> <laughs> You're brilliant. Thank you, sweetheart. You're a good girl too. It's very difficult and dangerous to do any kind of medical procedure with the big cats. In order to get hands-on, they have to be sedated. But it's notoriously tricky to get the anaesthetic dosage right, because different cats react in different ways to the drug. Last year, Kudu the tiger almost died while under anaesthetic. But today, three lions need to be sedated. Mafui, the big pride male, his young son Kamali, and Zazi, mother of this year's cubs, are due to have a routine test for a deadly disease. To do that, vet Duncan Williams will need a blood sample from each one. Go on, look, that way, go that way. I'm going to check them for feline immunodeficiency virus, similar to uh, HIV in humans. It is serious in lions if they have it. So we're just going to check the status of these three by taking a simple blood sample today. FIV, the cat's equivalent of HIV, can be sexually transmitted, but it also spreads through bites and scratches. So if the disease has somehow got into the pride, these three are the most likely to have caught it. But right now, keepers Bob Trollope and Brian Kent are more worried about the danger of the sedative drug. They would be totally anaesthetised. It's a very quick procedure, actually getting the blood, but obviously with wooden rigmarole of actually darting them and knocking them out and them coming in, it just takes a little while. There's an extra complication. Zazie will have to be separated from her new cubs. This will be the longest time that Nala and Stumpy have been away from Mum. The only thing we're concerned with is probably Zazie and the cubs, because they can obviously have to be split up from Mum for a while. So we need to get Mum recovered pretty quick so we can get the cubs back in with her. We just have to see what happens. Could be um, harder than we think, don't know. The first thing to do is to tease Zazie into a separate pen. Go on, that's it. Now to prepare the sedative darts. Because of the cubs, Duncan wants to use the minimum dose. We're going to do Zazie by blowpipe. We can so give her a smaller volume so that she wakes up a bit quicker. Zazie has never been anaesthetised before so no one knows how she'll react to the drug. All right, all right, darling. Go on, good shot. Bob Go is on. trying to distract Zazie while Brian delivers the dart. Look at me, look at me. Thank God. The first dart has injected only half its contents. It looks like she'll need another dose, and the cubs are already getting stressed. She's had some of it, and that's why she's feeling a bit wobbly. But she won't have enough for us to want to go in there and do any blood testing. We're just going to give her a slightly lighter dose so that she recovers quicker, so that the cubs aren't left alone without mum too long. You know, she's ever so wobbly, but it's not enough to, uh, to go in with. Right. Duncan prepares another dart. But Zazie now appears to be unconscious. I was wondering if she's going to need it. Zazie seems to be knocked out. Perhaps she's just very sensitive to the anaesthetic. If so, then an extra dose could kill her. On the other hand, if she's not fully out, she might suddenly come too. Right, jump. They're going to risk it. Might stay on that. This is a very dangerous situation.
the blood samples taken from a vein in the back leg. OK, take your hand off. Right, so I'll give her um, a revival dose. Big air, Bob. How are you? Duncan has a drug to reverse the effect of the anaesthetic. Now the team just have to wait to see if Zazie wakes up all right. Okay. And there are still the two males to do. Mafui is the biggest lion at Longleat, and young Kamali has never been darted before. We'll be back later to see what happens with them. It's been a week since young Evelyn had to be separated from her mother, Becky. The infection in the baby's ears seems to be a little better. But if mom and daughter were reunited, Becky would certainly start chewing them again. At least Evelyn is out in the paddock and she does have some company. The reason we have Jolly up here today, um, primarily it's for Evelyn's benefit. Obviously, she's way too young to leave on her own. Um, so uh, what with Jolly being such an experienced mother and having sort of spent the longest time, you know, as part of the herd, uh, we felt that she'd probably be about the best sort of auntie figure that we could provide for Evelyn. And because Jolly still does have some milk in her udder, as you can see, she's still got quite a full udder under there um, we have noticed that she's been offering Evelyn a drink even though we're giving Evelyn milk ourselves it's nice that Jolly's supplementing you know whatever we give with some of her own but two days later Evelyn has taken a turn for the worse she's lost her appetite and seems very depressed things haven't been going quite to plan really with Evelyn and the cow's milk we've been offering her we found that the first couple of days that we had taken her away from mum, Becky, uh, you know, she was really sort of quite keen to take the milk that we were offering. Um, but then, like I say, within a couple of days, really, she started just turning her nose up. It's that constant sort of juggling thing of, we need those ears to get better because we can't keep such a young, fairly weak animal with an infection like that, because if it gets into the blood and a septicemia sets in, for example, then we lose her, but obviously, she needs to drink as well. The milk is, you know, is the most important thing. We're all worried up at the giraffery, you know, because nobody likes to see a situation like this, you know. Everyone knows, especially within a safari park, everyone knows that the ideal situation is for her to be with her, her mum. So, um, I think there's lots of factors why she's looking so depressed. The fact that she's not developing properly, perhaps, is a factor, and obviously the fact that she's not constantly with mum, as she should be. Although she looks depressed, at the same time, she's still taking notice of her surroundings, her environment. If we're in here working, she watches us work. So she isn't just sort of standing in a corner with her eyes glazed over. That would be really, really worrying. But we haven't got to that stage yet and touch wood we won't get there you know poor little evelyn is in a very bad way she may not survive but only time will tell i've got to admit i'm not very keen on creepy crawly monsters Darren, Darren, Darren. Keep <laughs> sorry okay no no i'm <laughs> gonna be brave be brave Look, snakes it. fill me with a vague dread and you promised me they Just don't, eat, they don't eat presenters no i promise <laughs> no. And bats are certainly not my favourite animals. Ooh, cool. You're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's... Sorry, I'm very brave, actually. But if Kate can do it, so can I. The newest exhibit in Pet's Corner is Old Joe's Mine, where they keep all sorts of skin-crawling beasties. Now, Keeper Joe Hawthorne is going to help me to face one of my phobias. The trouble is, she hasn't told me which one. We have to clean one of these creatures out today. So okay. um, I've got to just give you a few ideas. Well, we're going to look at okay. two at the moment. Let's have right. a look. You have a look in there. OK. Very hairy legs uh, look suspicious <laughs> like a tarantula. <laughs> Please yes. tell me it's not that. No. OK. You're safe. <laughs> this one in here? In here. Oh, no, not <laughs> cockroaches. I hate them. <laughs> 
No. Okay. <laughs> um, this one in here is the one that you're going to be doing, but I'm not going to let you have a look because I'll give you three clues. Okay. They've been around for 300 million years. Wow, that's a long time. They are under the same class as spiders, but they're not. It's not a spider. Okay. And you have something in common with it. Hmm. <laughs> I'm intrigued, but I don't know whether that's good or bad. <laughs> okay, we should go and find out. Okay, okay. come on. This doesn't sound good, Joe. <laughs> Ah, okay. here we are, behind the scenes. <laughs> OK, right. this is slightly worrying. <laughs> Especially this big container you've given me. <laughs> She's in this box here. OK. The reason why we've got this wood on here is because this is part of the Creech Cave where people stick their hands through, and we need this on here because if she got out, she's quite dangerous. So I'm going to lift this up. Right, here she okay. is. I still can't see. You ready? Yes. OK. And she is behind here, if I lift this out. There you go. Oh, <laughs> a scorpion. Uh -huh. You get the clues now. She's related to the spider family? Part of the arachnid family, yes. Really? Um, they've been around for 300 million years, and they haven't changed a lot, so they've been on this planet for a long time. And someone tells me that you're a Scorpio. Oh, that's the relation. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me I look like it. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of Scorpios. Right. Well, how, how da I mean, I suppose the first thing I want to ask is how dangerous is she? Well, she is quite dangerous. They've got a that, sting that in little, the tail. That little yeah, see the little thing. hook on, yes. the, on, the, on the end there? They sting, it's like a, a bad bee sting. Obviously, so it didn't kill you or anything? No, 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 no. I mean, it's not toxic or anything. I mean, okay. obviously, there's different species that could do damage in that way, but she's quite harmless. Okay. And the claws at the front, they're quite powerful, so you won't really want to get in the way of those either. How on earth are we going to clean her up? Right, OK, we've yep. got this little scooping box. OK. Do you want to have a go, or...? What do we have to do? do literally we have scoop to, her out, do we? Literally, oh. if you put the box in on its side, OK, okay. Like, like this... Yep. Um, and I will... Oh, on its side like that, yeah. Yes, and I will try and move her into it with, with this piece of wood here. Okay. And hopefully she's going to be a really good girl and she's going to go in. And there's mine there, because you can see she's, she, she's quite feisty. So there we go, if you tip the, tip the box up now. There you go, she's in there and just place her in the box there. <laughs> okay. There uh, you go. That was brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. No, so she's, that, you so can see she's, big, she's so got her tail up there in the... Yeah. Is that ready to... So how oh, would she... Yes. Would she would she send the tail forwards? Is that all She backwards? would, and actually, she would just flail that round till she finds what she needs to sting, right. and then and that will be it, so... Now, I know we want to get her into the big box, don't we? How, um, should, should we, we do, yeah. If you just want to tilt the box up, so she'll, just... she'll just wheedle her way into the, into the big box there. Okay. She'll just scuttle out. She's very big, isn't she? She is. They're one of the largest, these. She's an imperial scorpion. Right. So, okay. quite feared, really. There you go. Wow, you and look at that what she's colour. About. You can really see her now. What about the claws? Would they actually bite you? They can they actually snap a pencil in two. That's no. how strong they are. Really? So you wouldn't want your finger in the way there, really. And would they grow much bigger than her? <laughs> um, she's fully grown now. She's a fully grown adult, so no, they don't get that much bigger. But in the scorpion world, she is one of the largest. OK, Jo, I think we should get cleaning, because okay. I don't want to annoy her. There you so go. I, um, Put great. your gloves on there. Yep. I'll take the uh, temperature thing out here. OK. And um, what we need to do, basically, is clean yeah. the um, tank out here. And okay. it gets a bit squirrely. So shall I just horrible. literally pull out some yeah, of the leaves? Yeah, just literally pull out everything. There's so. nothing else horrid in here, is no, there? Honestly, that I can suddenly no, honestly, no, no. No little baby scorpion, so don't worry. OK. <laughs> so is she, is she OK living on her own? Yeah, she's fine when they do mate, believe it or not. It's rather nasty, actually, because the male doesn't last very long because they mate and she'll usually end up eating him after. Oh, nice. So um, <laughs> she'll actually um, bear up to about 35 little babies and she'll carry them around on her back. Will she really? Mm. So she's quite a good mum at the wow. end of the day. So should so. I put some of this new... Yeah, if you want to kind of put some new leaves so in on the top there. How much there. do you think we want Yeah, give that? it a good covering on the ground there. Yeah, have, have you ever right been under. stung by a scorpion? No, I haven't, no. Touch wood. Not yet. No, I don't want to be either. No, I, I, I didn't <laughs> think so. They have, a, they have a quite a fearsome reputation, I'd say. They do, yes. These come from kind of West Africa in the jungle grassland, so you wouldn't really want to step on one by accident, really. Right. Just wipe around the glass and yep. just get the kind of condensation out. and okay. Just what we've got to keep her nice and humid. And yep. That's fine. How have I done? Right, brilliantly. Now, now we've, we've got, got to get, her, got to get back her, back in. her back in again now. Here we go, we've got the little container. I so have every confidence. Shall I do the same thing? Do. Yep. Right, come on, sweetheart, in you go, be a good girl. Come on. Come on. Right, you're there. If you tip the box up. Brilliant, there you go. <laughs> OK, <laughs> just keep that side of the box, yeah, away from the tail. OK. Um, and and then just up. gently place her in there. And if you tip, tip her <laughs> <Sorry>. up, <laughs> you're doing really well. I didn't drop that out. 
I'm very tough, really. Right, you, you tip, and then just tip the... Yeah, just tip her up. She'll scuttle out there. Ta -da! Brilliant! There would, you I, go. would I get a job here? You didn't faint or anything, so No, either. Joe, thank you That's very all right. much. <laughs> Surprisingly, that wasn't as bad as I thought, but maybe it's because we have something in common. <laughs> We're both scorpions of one kind or another. Elsewhere in Pets Corner, the keeper in charge, Darren Beasley, is over the moon. We've got some brilliant news. Um, at last, we've got what we call a 100% well, marmoset success. Uh, Mike and Michelle are two Jeff Royce marmosets, have had a baby. Uh, they've not only had a baby, they've looked after it, they've reared it, dad's carried it, mum's fed it, uh, and it's now eating solid food, and it has got to be uh, one of the best looking animals. Where are we? Hell, oh, mate. It's right up in the top here. Absolutely fantastic. That's what this job's about. That's what makes the job really, really good and fun and rewarding. Just there. Jeffroy's tufted eared marmosets are a threatened species, so the six week old baby needs to be registered as part of an international captive breeding program. But so far, no one has got close enough to find out if it's a boy or a girl. As well as looking after the creepy creatures, Jo Hawthorne also works with the cute ones. She's got a plan. Right, what we're doing today is... I've got their favourite thing here, locusts. Mum and Dad are waiting here and hopefully we can coax the baby down and get a proper look. Come on. The idea is, while Mum and Dad are distracted by eating their favourite food, hopefully we'll be able to get a closer look at the baby. Come on. Everyone's really relieved. I mean, this is kind of a first successful rearing for us now of the Marmoset, so we're really, really happy about that. And hopefully in, in the future to come, we'll have some more successful births. There's nothing scientific about determining the baby's sex. Joe is just waiting for a chance to see if it's got the male bits. Oh, actually, if we look now, look, baby's just stretching up. I'm pretty sure that's a girl. She's got no, we're actually obviously looking for all the boys' bits there, um, and she hasn't got any, so I'd say that's a girl, definitely, yeah. So now, um, she hasn't got a name yet, we haven't named her, so we can now look through the girl's <laughs> name book now to, to decide what we're going to call her, which is great. Now they know the sex, Darren can register the birth. Jeffroy's marmosets, like all the little marmoset monkeys and the tamarins, are actually vulnerable, if not threatened and endangered. So this is not just a birth for us at Longley. This is a, a birth for Jeff Roy's marmosets throughout the whole world. These are in a, a registered stud book throughout the whole of Europe and the world as well. Basically, she gets a little number and then she can join the breeding programme for this endangered species, hopefully now, the rest of its days with a bit of luck. But this little girl still has a lot of growing to do. We'll be back later to see how she gets on. I'm out at Gorilla Island with head of section Mark Ty, and just out for the morning is Nico. He came out at quite a speed. I thought he was old, Mark. He's no, not showing his age too much. He's just fooling you, isn't he, really? <laughs> he's still pretty quick on his toes. He really is, isn't he? And looking very yeah. well. Yeah, exceptionally well. I mean, you know, it amazes me that for the age that he is, 45, he still looks in such good condition and still fit and active. I know you had some worrying times with him, and there were times where he was actually looking quite dejected and quite sorry for himself. Yeah, he was very ill a couple of years ago, and we really thought we were going to lose him. For him to pick himself back up and get back into a sort of tip-top condition, if you like, has been a sort of real sort of miracle, if you like. It's so lovely to see him, and clearly he's got his appetite back. Absolutely. That's not faded much at all. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? Because it looks like, well, I can't actually see what he's eating. Well, we... we put all sorts out on the island, it's all varieties of fruit and vegetables, peanuts, dog biscuits, special primate pellets, and we just chop it all up and scatter it everywhere. And, you know, we let the gr island grow a bit wild for a while yeah. and let the grass grow up so that then they, they've got to actually forage around and hunt for the food. And that's w presumably what they would do in the wild, is it? Yeah, absolutely. They'd have to go out and look for it. 
So that's what we try to replicate here. And do you know roughly how much time they would spend foraging as opposed to kind of sleeping? Are they, are they, would they forage all day or just for a bit of the day? Um, they probably wouldn't forage all day because they are quite lazy creatures, really, and they do like a lot of sitting around. Yeah. I don't know how it would be split, but they eat until they're full and then they just lie about and sleep and be lazy. That sounds like a lovely life. Well, yeah. Mark, it's great to see him. Thank you very much indeed. And here's what else is coming up on today's programme. There's something nasty down the pit in old Joe's mine. It's not very fragrant down here, is it, Mike? Oh, it stinks. The rhinos are queuing up for their skincare treatment. Come on, your turn. In you come. Absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. And we'll find out if young Evelyn can beat the infection in her ears. But now we're going back up to the lion house where vet Duncan Williams is taking blood samples to test three of the lions for FIV, the cat's equivalent of HIV. Zazie has already been done and they're just waiting for her to come round from the anaesthetic. Her two cubs, Nala and Stumpy, are in a separate pen and looking anxious. The next lion who needs to be sedated is Mafui. He's the pride male and he's very large. Keepers Brian Kent and Bob Trollope are expecting trouble. I think one of our biggest problems is going to be Mathui because he's, once he's in the house, he's a bit of a stubborn so-and-so. And it's just getting him into the right position <laughs> to be able to dart him or actually moving him. I think that's going to be the, the tester. He's a bit more wiser than yeah. the rest of them, <laughs> so we'll be a bit harder with him, maybe. Because Mafui is bigger than the others, he needs a higher dose, so they're going to use the gun. It's a specially adapted air pistol that can fire a larger sedative dart. This is a risky procedure, and not just for the lions. Right, we're just going to go in and try and dart the fooey. The only thing you've got to be wary of, if you're following around, be careful, because if the dart occasionally can bounce back out. So, if it, you know, be aware of that in case it comes flying at you. You don't want a dart stuck in your head. All right. <laughs> Mafui knows there's something up. Oh, hey, Mafui, Mafui, this way. Hey, oh, that's a good Brian one. is aiming for the large muscles of the rear leg. Just be careful now in case it bounces out. That's it, go in there. That's it, lucky one. Well, basically, now it'll take about. 15 to 20 minutes before he's out. It sounded like the actual dart did go off because you could hear the, the cartridge in the, inside the barrel. So we just pull out now and um, hopefully go to sleep. While Mafui is going under, Brian checks on Zazie. She's just coming round from the anaesthetic. She wants to get up. She obviously can't work out why she can't get up. She's got cubs to look after. You don't want her stumbling about and falling over on the cubs. So uh, you've got to be a bit careful. So obviously we we'll monitor it for a while. And, uh, you know, if we we're happy enough, we let her back in with the cubs. Kamali is next. He's Mafui's son and not yet fully grown. Just 18 months ago, Kamali was the same size as Zazie's little cubs. Kamali is a joy to watch out in the section because he's, he's at that age where he still plays. A bit of a nuisance to the older ones, but a bit of fun to the younger ones. And, yeah, he's just a, a teenager, I suppose. He's just having fun. But now Kamali needs to be darted, and this will be the first time he's ever been sedated. Hopefully it's not a stressful situation for very long. The fact that he's going to be locked in will most probably be the most stressful part of it. Um, you normally find when they're sedated for the first time, they go out normally pretty quick. Right, mate. Good boy. <laughs> You're laid back, aren't you? Being smaller than Mafui, they're using the blowpipe. All right. Ah, 
The anesthetic should take about 15 minutes to knock Kamali out. Mafui is now totally unconscious and the team can begin. This is a rare opportunity for the vet Duncan Williams to check his general health, but he must be quick. He's excellent, yeah, he's in very good nick. Lovely. Now to take the blood sample. Mafui's breathing is good, so they leave him to recover. Yeah. Gotta check his mouth and work. Yeah. Now Kamali is out and they move straight on to him. That's perfect. Look at that lovely teeth. No damage at all. As soon as they have the blood, the anesthetic reversal is administered. He's breathing well, but Duncan is wary. He's had relatively the most dose for the size of the animal. He's probably smaller than that female. He certainly had a lot more than she did, so... Today has been great so far. It's just the recovering bit that we've got to monitor. But yeah, it's looking good. In fact, Zazie was soon reunited with her cubs, and it wasn't long before the boys were back on their feet. And there was more good news when the results of the blood tests came back. All three are completely healthy. Back in old Joe's mine, I've come to meet keeper Mike Holloman. He has a job for me, and I'm not looking forward to it. OK, Mike, where do we begin here? <laughs> right, well, first of all, we've got to get them all in that cage there. OK, Bef do... before you open up, are they safe? They're all friendly except skits. OK, Will well, you I'll tell you which you'll, one. You'll recognise skits. skits. Yeah. Okay, so what, where they're going to go into this cage, presumably. Yep. Push they must be very thing. agile if they're going to be able to climb up that wall. Oh, they're very good. They can get anywhere, rats. But you've got to call them, so it's... Ratty, ratty, ratties, come on in! Ratty, ratty, ratties. Look, here they come. There you are, I see you. Are they going to know exactly to... Yeah. Can, you can handle them, can you? Oh, yes, look at that. There you are. Right. Would you like her? Sweet, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, do you hold them in a particular way? Uh, just sort of under the legs, so cool. they're comfortable. And pop a ring... That one's okay. going to go in on its own, that. <laughs> can, so can you recognise each individual rat? Yeah, that one there is go. Maisie. Do you go? Go this on, little Maisie. one is Claire. Go on, Claire. In you go. And where do you okay. think you're going, sweetie? They have a bit of a bad reputation, don't they? Well, that's wild rats. So what's the difference between these and the rats that you don't want? Uh, well, these are fancy house? rats. I know they look very much like the wild rat. Mm -hmm. There yes. she is. There's another one. So how many live in here? There's 14 altogether. Only right. one's nasty. And are they a mixture of boys and girls? No, all girls. So notice, no smell. Not smelly rats, are we? No. Nice. Pop them all in. I can ask what sort of food you've got in there that's uh, into the cage. It's a bit of bread. There's some carrot in there. Right. But the banana, that's an extra little treat for today. Okay. And there's some nuts. Because it's nuts for their well. teeth, but you can't give them too much in the way of nuts. Otherwise, they'll get too fat. Do they make good pets? Very good pets. This is one of the best pets on the Look planet, to be honest. Coming up here. Look at it climbing up the wall. Come on, then. Is it little claws that are... Yes, they've got little claws. This is Amy coming up. Amy, and they can literally climb up brickwork like that. Oh, yes. How many more? I think we've <laughs> got... Oh, we've still one got to Skits. Come. Skits is the bitey one, is it? Yes, Skits is the bitey one. I am very brave, Mike, but I think I'll, um, <laughs> I'll let you do that task today. <laughs> oh, so thank they, you so they much. They all have their own personalities, then? Oh, most definitely. Here's Skits. OK. In the box, Skits. Here she comes. OK. And if you open the... There you go. And that was well done. A cage <laughs> full of rats. Look at that. OK. Right. You're in there. I hope I'm not scared of small spaces. I don't think I am. Well, you're about to find and out. And how often do you have to do this, Mike? Uh, we do it every day, but the clean out really well every sort of once every week. OK. And how do, how do the public react to the rats? That's what I want to know. Some people don't like them. Some people won't even walk over the glass with them. Really? They, really, They yeah. have such a phobia about them. Yes. I used to work on a farm, and I didn't like the wild rats, I must admit. Are you keen to sort of improve their image here, or do you like to keep that slight mystery about the rats? I like to improve it, to be honest. Do you? <laughs> yeah, because I like them so much. And it's a shame that people are frightened of them. Do you mind this task? Do you, um, I don't. Do you enjoy it doesn't it? worry me. Poo and muck, no problem. It's all part of a, a day's work. Do you have a favourite rat, Mike? Maisie. <laughs> Maisie. <laughs> She's just lovely. She'll sit on my shoulder and she'll clean herself. And she hasn't peed on me yet. <laughs> well, it looks like we um, have a lot of cleaning ahead of us. You better leave us to it. Just into there, Mike. Yes, please. On that one. The things you get me to do, Mike, honestly. <laughs> In Pet's Corner, Mike and Michelle, the Marmosets, have a new baby girl. 
The keepers have been trying to think up a name for her, and now Jo Hawthorne has come up with a rather special one. We're going to call her Mandu, because that's the name um, of the goddess of the rainforest. Um, and we thought that was rather fitting, seeing as they do come from the Brazilian rainforest. It's a very kind of old, mythical name. It goes with where she's from, so Mike, Michelle and Mandu. <laughs> With marmosets, both mum and dad help out with the childcare. Dad is being a superb dad. Um, I mean, they're both really good. The last birth we had with marmites, he wasn't really particularly very good. But this time, I mean, he's taken to her absolutely brilliantly. When she comes down for food, you know, he might be chomping away on a locust. And he just kind of gives it up to her. She comes down and kind of snatches it away from him. Or he'll have, you know, a handful of mealworms and, and she comes down and kind of he just gives them up to her. So he's really patient, very good dad. Mandu is now nearly three months old and she's started to eat fruit and bugs. In the wild, marmosets also eat tree sap. So here at Longleat, they get gum arabic, which comes from acacia trees. I'm actually giving them their gum for the morning. Um, they absolutely love the gum. Obviously, where they are in the wild, they would extract this from the trees um, with their very sharp teeth. I um, mean, you'll see in a moment, Dad's kind of coming over now, but the, the gum is, is really good for them. It's got lots of um, nutrients in. Mandu is eating well and growing fast. Soon, the time will come for Jo to let her outside for her first taste of freedom. 18 months ago, Longleat got three new white rhinos. They came from a game reserve in South Africa, and it was a big day when they finally arrived in Wiltshire. The hope is that they'll form a new breeding herd, but the rhinos, one male and two females, are still a little young to be starting a family. They've settled in well, but now the British winter has caused a problem with their skin. Normally, rhinos keep their skin in good condition by wallowing in mud, followed by some heavy-duty scratching. But in cold weather, they just can't be persuaded to have a mud bath. So the keepers need to do something to help them out. I'm up at the Rhino House to look at their winter skincare programme, and I'm here with Head of Section Tim Yeo. Nearly tripped over a bucket, bucket. there, Tim. <laughs> um, food, is this an important part of a skincare programme? Well, it's, it's in its experimental stage at right. the moment, but it, I mean, we think that it, it could well be because during the winter months when the rhino are not going out every day into the park, they're not having access to, to rolling in the mud. Because it's too cold. It's, exactly, it's too cold. They really don't like it. So this is an attempt to try and do something from the inside of the rhino by giving this in feed. So a bit like us taking, I don't know, cod liver oil or something for our skin. This is the same sort of theory, is it? Exactly, Kate. Yes, exactly the same. So what sort of feed is this? This is straight linseed mm -hmm. and this is whole barley here. Right. And we're doing about four to five parts linseed to about two to three barley. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're mixing that in a bucket and then we're, we're boiling that for about 12 hours. Right. On a slow boil. Yeah. And, and what we're doing is we're trying to get the oil out of the linseed to come out of so the that's, linseed. So that's the sort of cod liver oil equivalent, is it? Exactly. I mean, how does mud help their skin? What is it that it does to keep their skin in good order? They get caked in mud and the mud dries. Yeah. And then when, the mud, uh, when they rub the mud off or the mud gets blown off in dust, it takes away dead skin. Right, and, so it's and like an exfoliating effect. Quite. The dead skin is stopping the new skin from growing, really. It's stopping skin breathing. This is the boiled up stuff, is it, in here? This is what it looks like. So this then promotes the, the kind of new skin coming through. That's what we're really hoping. It's used a lot in, in, in horses and has been for, for a long time. Uh, but we're hoping the same will, will, will help the, the, the rhino, really. OK. Well, I know that Ben is um, over there doing his bit for their skincare regime. What are you up to, Ben? <laughs> well, while Kate prepares the food, I'm here with a more hands-on approach with Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner. Now, Ian, all this stuff that's coming off, is this literally rhino skin? Yeah, it's flaky skin. It's what they've... Uh, this, this, this brings out the new skins that's coming through. There's a bit of mud involved here. Do they enjoy this? this? Yeah, they do. I mean, if you come round to here, the front bit, yep. you just feel behind that the ear. Literally, put my put my hand yeah, just in there. You feel how soft that is. 
really soft. Because yeah. there's yeah. a sort of saying, as thick as a rhino's skin. Yeah. So, I mean, how thick is this skin up here that we're, we're kind of rubbing away at and scratching off? Yeah, that'll be over half an inch thick, whereas this bit behind here is, is baby's bottom. It's that soft, isn't it? And that's the bit we like. You really enjoy being... I'm amazed that we can be here. so tactile with a big, sort of hefty <laughs> rhino like this. And literally, if you didn't like it, you'd go off. Yeah. How often would you do something like this, a sort of skin rub? I mean, you might not come to do it all, you know, all day. You just try and get as much as you can off. Yeah. Once the rhino's well, fed comes, up, comes, here, So yeah. one, one's come one's through called, the... One's the other one's taking over not. Your turn. I missed out. Look, so they yeah. really... That's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. That they come through. So you've obviously got the three here, and do they all do they all go through this sort of process? Yeah, these are the three new ones they got from South Africa. Right. So they're um, still quite young, are they? Yeah. They've got a lot of growing to do, yeah. And have they totally acclimatised to our weather here? Totally, yeah. We just have to get the Look, skin next, in next, next one comes. <laughs> Ian, thank you very much. I think you better leave us to it because it looks like we have quite a lot of scrubbing to do. OK. Oh, Bye. careful. Come on, your turn. Here you come. Two weeks ago, Becky the giraffe began to chew at her new baby's ears. Ten days ago, an infection set in and young Evelyn had to be separated from her mum. The vet put her on a course of antibiotics and the ears seemed to be healing. Then Evelyn went off her food and became depressed. As a last resort, the keepers put her back with her mother. But now, this morning, there's some dreadful news. Little Evelyn died in the night. That's a disaster, isn't it? It's a shame. It is such a, a crying shame that you've got a lovely little female giraffe that was going to give us calves in the future. Um, and she was a nice addition to the group, and and you lose her. You know, you always kind of question what you've what you've done, whether you've done the right thing. I mean, if you lose them within a week of being born, that's kind of acceptable to a point. Uh, when you lose them after two months and it's a perfectly healthy animal and it dies because you've not so much we've taken it away, but because of the the, the ear infection and. And, and, and the sort of the little bit of stress and everything, you know, you kind of, you do feel responsible. We were surprised to find her gone this morning. You know, if, if I'd have had to have sort of guessed when it would have been, it would have been in the previous week. Um, but having got her back with her mum and seen her drink so well, we thought that possibly she might have turned the corner. But they're big animals, but they're very delicate at the same time. Vet Duncan Williams carried out a post-mortem to find out why she died. Basically, we found what we kind of expected. She died from septicemia, I think probably got into her body, into her system, into her heart and stuff before the antibiotics were first administered. So while well, we kept her alive for a week with the antibiotics, I mean, it's just sort of caught up with her. And, um, and unfortunately, that, 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 you know, that's what sort of finished her off, really. She did have loads very full stomach I and mean, she had loads of milk in her stomach and it was all the way through through her gut so she you know she was eating enough it's just the, uh, the initial infection in the ears got into her system and, and, and finished her off really and to lose a two-month-old giraffe is very abnormal once they get past the first week you know you generally think yeah, yeah they're gonna be okay so it's very abnormal to lose one of that age and, and disappointed really yeah this is the first one we've sort of, first calf we've lost like this. We've had three births recently and two of them went so well. I think, you know, maybe we just thought the third one was going to be fine as well. So, yeah, it's quite tough. In old Joe's mine, it's my turn to meet Mike Holloman, who's got another nasty job for us. They keep it dark in here because this is home to an animal that only comes out at night. I'm in the back cave with keeper Mike Holloman and um, a bucket, which <laughs> says something to me, Mike. You're uh, going to get me to do a dirty job, aren't you? 
Yeah, mucking out, I'm afraid. Don't really imagine mucking out bats. I just sort of leave them to it. Uh, but they smell if, uh, very strongly if you don't oh, keep really? them out. Oh, yes. <laughs> that really sounds stink. like the voice of experience. <laughs> I'm afraid so, yes. <laughs> OK, so what's the first job? First thing, get the fruit off of there. OK. Now, while I'm doing this, I don't know how well you can hear, but there are bats just whizzing around us. The thing that makes me slightly nervous, Mike, is that they might get stuck in my hair. Ah, uh, that's an old wives' tale. Is uh, it? Yes. If you think about it, there's six billion of us roughly on the planet. Yeah. Many billions of bats. So yeah. somewhere along the line, someone's going to headbutt a bat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not a usual occurrence. It's not a usual occurrence. You've got to remember, they're much smaller than we are. If they hit us, they'll get the bigger headache. Because they're used to living in the dark, Presumably, they have quite a sophisticated way of navigating themselves around. Yeah, did you hear a ticking noise, like... Yeah. That's their echolocation. They're one of the few bats in the world you can actually hear with a human ear. Reason wow. being is they do it with the tongue on the roofs of the mouth. So what sort of bats are these? These are Egyptian fruit bats. They're quite big, actually, when you look at them, because you always think of bats as being flying mice, but these look more like flying rats. Uh, They're sort of rat-sized, aren't they? But these are small for fruit bats. The biggest fruit bat has a wingspan of roughly six foot, and that's a Samoan fruit <gasps> bat. Wow, I'm quite <laughs> glad those aren't flying yeah, around my head. decapitate us. Right, I've got, the, um, yeah. I've got that off. What's next? Well, you saw they had the fruit there. Well, yeah. guess what? It falls down in the pit. So, that is a smelly job for you, Kate, I'm afraid. What I've got to get in there? You certainly have. Oh, Mike. I'm sorry, I always give you the wrong jobs. You do, I? yes. Yeah. How do I get in? I'm not going to get through one of those no. caps, that's for sure. <laughs> There's a ladder over there. Right. And what I'll do is I'll pull this rope up. OK. And I'll try not to drop it on you. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> there isn't anything nasty lurking in the bottom of here, is there, apart well, I've from... I've never met kind of... anything under there yet. <laughs> there we are. That'll do. And okay. then you just go down that ladder over there. Catch all of that rope there. That's str that is strong. This one here? Yeah, I, I'm okay. pretty sure you're not as heavy as I am. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't count on it, actually. That's right? it. You've got it. Right. Oh, very agile. There's the uh, dustpan and brush just there and the bucket. It's not very fragrant down here, over. is it, Mike? Oh, it stinks. It does. <laughs> it's quite slimy as well. Oh, oh, I'm afraid it is. But I did leave it for a few days, so I heard you were coming. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> Presumably... They're called fruit bats. Fruit is their main diet, is their it? Their main diet, but obviously you don't get fruit all year round, so they eat a lot of nectar from flowers. Oh, really? So, um, and would they feed on it like a butterfly would feed on that it? That sort of thing. They've got very long tongues. And you might not believe this, but 70% of all the fruit you've ever eaten, the flowers were pollinated solely by bats. Is that right? That is right, yeah. Obviously not ours in this country, because ours are insect-eating bats. Yeah. But all the sort of tropical countries, sort of tropical fruits and stuff, yeah. they're all done by bats. Pollinated by bats. That is amazing. Well, Mike, I'd like to say thank you very much, but I'm not sure I want to thank you for anything at the moment. <laughs> I need to be bit down this pit for hours. Well, duck down, Kate, because <laughs> guess what's coming down behind you? <laughs> oh, Don't you dare! <laughs> <laughs> The weather is getting warmer, and in Pet's Corner, Joe Hawthorne is letting the marmosets outside for the first time this year. Around the marmoset house is an open enclosure. There's no netting or bars to keep them in. This shouldn't be a problem, because these little monkeys are quite shy and naturally stay in their own territory. But there's always the worry that little Mandu might try to escape. But now, the marmosets are in no rush to come out at all. They haven't been out yet this year, so it's quite daring for them. It's a big thing and there's lots of people around, lots of different noises, so... Once they kind of decide that it's safe to come out, then they, they normally do. There you go, that's Dad. I think Baby's thinking about it. She's sat in the doorway there. Might take a while, but... Oh! Something frightening. Yeah, we are, they're out. That's good. Come on, then. Come on in. Hopefully, she'll kind of suss out to stay with Mum and Dad. Let's have a look. Come on, sweetie. Come on. She can see Mum and Dad, but she can't work out how to get back in again. She can't work out why Mum and Dad are just through the, through the mesh there, and she can't figure out where the door is, so we need to kind of lead her back to the door so that she knows when she comes out next that so that's the way back in as well. <laughs> Come on, then. It's good that Mandu is so keen to get back with Mum and Dad. This instinct will keep her safe. But if only she could find the way home. 
Well, she's got to work it out for herself, really. It's so frustrating, because it's so close. <laughs> Come on, sweetie, here, look. Here, look. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, at last. Oh, we got there in the end. It took a long time, but um, she's managed to find her way back in, so that's good. <laughs> a nice moment to see them back together again. Ferrets everywhere. I keep worrying everywhere. I'm sitting on them. <laughs> they are attacking our salmon. I think they've fallen in love with Gary the Salmon. We've had we quite a stressful day though. We I have. think we needed a bit of ferret fun to cheer us up. I think so. What was your what was your worst part? Well, I have to say the bats I thought are absolutely fascinating. And the spider, although it was really interesting to learn about it, if I ever have to hold that spider again, I think I'll faint. <laughs> I've never been so scared in my life. Ever. I, th I have to say that the um the scorpion was the was the one part I was most dreading really? first time. But once you get really close to it, and um, and it doesn't sting you or bite yeah. you, um, I actually, I don't say I, I w wouldn't say that I've grown attached to it, but I might consider doing it again. They are they are amazing creatures, absolutely amazing creatures, but just not as cute as these, are they? <laughs> well, sadly, that's all we've got time for on today's program. But here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go up my shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Two of Longleat's three tigers are facing life-threatening operations. There's always that major worry in the back of your mind that something's going to go wrong. Kim, the wallaby, lost her mother at a young age. Now she's got a baby of her own. That's what I was a bit worried about, if she would know what to do. And the master stag is in big trouble when his antlers fall off. The other stags have still got their antlers, their weapons. It's an extremely dangerous time for an adult master stag. That's all coming up in the next Animal Park. <laughs>